Okay, so welcome everyone to the uh, OWASP Cincinnati meetup for March 2024. Um, thank you all for coming. Great to see you all. Uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of housekeeping. I um, wanted to announce that Jay Simmons is now officially a co-lead of the Cincinnati OWASP chapter, um, replacing Ryan Jones, who doesn't look like he's here, but I want to thank him tremendously for uh, the work he's put into this and for, for the last several years um, being co-lead. So really appreciate him and uh, excited to have Jay on board now. Um, he's sort of been behind the scenes doing a lot of stuff previously already. Um, it's just now it's official. So um, it's great to have you, Jay. Thank you for, for staying. Um, with that, uh, I wanted to introduce Tanya Jenka. Um, I'm assuming I'm assuming most of you already know what Tanya Jenka is because uh, I think when it comes to AppSec, uh, Tanya is the first person who, the first name I associate with AppSec really. Um, the author of uh, Alice and Bob Learn Application Security, the founder of We Hack Purple, and now at SEMGREP. So um, really look her up, read her books, follow her content. She's awesome, a uh, big OWASP contributor, and um, really happy to have her here to, to discuss. Uh, we always talk about de um, best practices. It's going to be great to talk about worst practices for once. It'll be, I think it'll be really fun. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Tanya. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I have never actually got to be in Cincinnati in person. And so, I mean, obviously it's not as good as actually being there with you, but um, when I got the message from the chat, like from, I, I'm not sure if I'm saying your name correctly, Shlomo? When yep, you got it. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay, perfect. I was like, oh yeah, definitely don't wanna do that. <laughs> so thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so you, I'm gonna assume you can share my screen or you can see my screen. Perfect, yep. okay, thank you. So hi, I'm Tanya um, and I wanna talk about worst practices instead of best practices. One, because um, I've learned that when I just submit boring titles for things that conferences say no. <laughs> And if I give a fancier title, people are more excited about it. But anyway, okay, so I consult with this group called IAMS Research. And basically, maybe one hour or two hours a week, I'll meet with different AppSec teams and I'll help them with their programs. And one of them, basically two years ago, said, you know, we've met with you about what we should do with our DevSecOps program that we're starting, but what should we not do? Like, could you make a list of all the things you see people stumble over? And so I thought about it for about a week. <laughs> and as I thought about it more and more, I came up with, so at first there were just five things, but then I like really dug into all the different calls I'd done. Cause it's like, they kind of hit a nerve with me. I was like, you know what? That's, that's really smart. I should make a list of what to warn my clients about. So I came up with 15 things. So all the things on this list, um, or let's say uh, all of them, but two, 10 or more of my clients have stumbled over this because I've met with over 400 AppSec teams over the past five years at IAMS. And so uh, two of them are ones where they're just such a huge stumble <laughs> that I really, really don't want that to ever happen to you. So I added them to the list because it hurt so bad. Um, and so uh, that's why I made this list was just for one client and I started sharing it with all the clients and then they're like, that was really good. Maybe you should write a blog or do a talk, Tanya. I'm like, oh, it seems so obvious when they say it. Um, and so thank you for being here to listen to this. So we're gonna talk about DevSecOps and we're gonna talk about tried, tested and failed approaches. Um, how and why to avoid these problems, like I just said. And so let's go. So who am I? So I'm Tanya and I do a lot of stuff. I advise um, at Catalyst and NordVPN. I'm IAN's research faculty. I've done a lot of stuff like counterterrorism. Um, software development, I worked at Microsoft, Adobe, <clears throat> Nokia, I've started my own companies. I've been doing this since, I've been coding since I was a teenager, but like the moment I turned 18, I started working at an IT company and it's all I've ever really done, that uh, and, and music. And so um, I really am a giant nerd. <laughs> I hope that's your key takeaway from the, I am qualified to give this talk slide. Um, that's why we do this slide. So you might be, um, how do I word this? You you might be thinking like, why do, do we do this slide where we brag about ourselves? So speakers do this slide to try to show you that we're competent and that um, 
and hopes that you'll sit through the rest of the talk. So I hope I've at least impressed you a tidy bit and you're like, she seems all right, let's go. Okay, so I call those my resting AppSec face. <laughs> so when things are not going my way <laughs> with my AppSec stuff, I get this face. And I'm just like, you did what now? What have you done? <laughs> I'm gonna sometimes clients tell me things and I'm like, ah, um, okay. So my definition of DevSecOps, I like to think of it as an, a, an application security person who works in a DevOps shop. And so that means we have to kind of change the way we do things versus if we're in an agile shop or a waterfall shop, it's like, oh, I might need different tools. I may need to, you know, squish my work into sprints or time it differently. Um, I need to work the way the developers are working. That's what I like to think of DevSecOps as. However, other people have different definitions. And another super common definition is the AppSec person who owns all the cool tools. And um, I also wanna own the cool tools, just to be clear. <laughs> I find um, I find CICD super duper duper fun. Uh, it's way more fun than waiting six weeks until the QA team decides that they wanna manually test something for me. Um, like many of my friends have done QA, I have done QA before, but being able to automate and not have to wait or even having the QA team help me do it, like super fun. And so whichever your definition of DevSecOps is, let's go together. So DevSecOps, it's not easy though. Like marketing people are like, you just click this button and magic happens. We all know that's not true. Sometimes it goes poorly. I find because our industry, a lot of the information we deal with is sensitive, a lot of us aren't sharing uh, mistakes. And when I first joined the industry, I remember someone wanted to interview me and ask about you know, security incidents and all this stuff. And I was like, listen, my whole career was in the government. That means every answer I give is clearly the Canadian government. And that means I'm breaking an NDA. But now that I've worked with hundreds of companies, it sounds weird, but now it's anonymized itself. Um, and not only through IAM's research, but private contracts, et cetera. So now I'm able to share more because of the anonymity, because when you deal with so many people. And so there's 15 things we're gonna start, and this is number one, and it is the boy who cried wolf. <laughs> um, and by this, I mean breaking builds on false positives. It is, um, actually, can I, is there, oh, no, back, back, okay. so. Basically, um, if you have lots of false positives and you have a tool in the CI CD and you've set it to breaking instead of just alerting mode. So you're gonna stop the entire CI and you're like, you cannot go to prod, do not pass go, do not collect $200. <laughs> We're just breaking the build on you. And then it's a false positive. People are like, oh, this stinks. If you do that 10 times in a row, they think you stink. Um, this is not a good way to make friends or influence people or build trust. And so when we break a build over and over again, this is not good. And I see this the most often with static analysis tools that are first generation, especially. So not all the first gens, but a lot of them where they will find everything you've ever dreamed of, but they also find all sorts of things that aren't a problem. And as a result, you get lots of vulnerabilities that aren't, or you get lots of vulnerabilities reported that aren't actually causing business risk. And so to avoid this, I have a lot of suggestions. So one, look at your tools first, run them first in alerting mode and make sure the results you're getting are true positives. If you have a tool that has lots of false positives, that doesn't mean the tool sucks. It means it sucks to have it in blocking mode in your CI, right? So this could mean, you run it in the CI, but only in alerting mode. And someone goes and takes those results later. It could mean instead you run it once a week across your code base, and then someone looks at it. It could mean you, um, you run it manually when it makes sense for you. There's lots of different options, but I would suggest you do not put it in your CI, certainly not in blocking mode, because you're just gonna make your software developers not trust you and not trust your tools. And quite frankly, they'll just turn them off behind your back eventually. Um, I went to work somewhere once with a really amazing human. He had worked there 12 years and he'd been a dev and slowly switched into their first AppSec person. 
and he had spent years rolling out a first generation stack analysis tool, which I'm not going to name because I work at a stack analysis place and I don't want to talk poorly about our competitors. But basically, um, the way he'd rolled it out had a lot of false positives and it would break the builds all the time. And when I started, he was like, yeah, every single build has this. We like break the build if there's any vulns, we do blah, blah, blah. And we went and looked and it had been disabled 100%. It was an alerting for a handful, uh, but not breaking like he thought. And all the rest, like 90% had just been disabled completely. And I swear I could see his heart break inside his chest. And he'd spent two years rolling it out. So it's really important that your tools are accurate. So this is the most important one. That's why it's number one. And I see it the most often. Okay, number two, untested tools. So this might sound very similar to number one, but a tool that so when we're going to put a tool in a CI CD, the, we want to test it first. So what I like to do is I clone a CI of a team that likes me and tolerates me. Uh, and then I put the tools in that I want. And and in my clone, and then I remove it so it's not releasing anywhere. So it runs lots of tests, but it's not actually releasing to an environment. So I'm not messing with this very nice team that let me clone their CI because that would not be cool. And then I add whatever tool I'm playing with and I test like, how long does this run? Does it crash? Does it do the types of tests I actually want? Am I getting results that are helpful? There's way more than just, is it giving me a false positive? Is it giving me tons of false negatives and like a completely false sense of security? I've seen some dynamic scanners where they're like, you're good. I'm like, this is not good. This is a piece of crap. I know this is crappy. I've tested it before. <laughs> and you're telling me it's great. I'm like, this tool stinks, right? So you wanna make sure that the results you're getting are good. The speed is good. Um, you wanna make sure just point blank, it doesn't just crash because I've seen that. So you wanna, so software developers test all the time right? Like they test their tools, they test their code, their, their unit tests, they do like every single, we should test our stuff too. So test the things before you do it, because otherwise you can end up with, like I, I've had this where they're like, yeah, I kicked off my CD, CI CD and like it's the next day and it's still running. Like why did you break all my stuff? We don't want to be that security person. We don't want to hear that feedback. We want to test all these things ourselves, fix all the things, make sure it's good before we show the devs so we continue with good. So we continue to build trust instead of breaking it. Okay, artificial gates. So this is a weird one that I've like, I, I so no one says, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna build an artificial gate and trick everyone. They don't think of it that way. But so I used to, um, well, I still have this friend, but her and I both used to work in the government and both of us have since left the government. And I remember her saying to me, I know DevOps is good. I know the software developers want to go fast, but they just go too fast. I want to put gates in front of them because I cannot keep up. And I'm so terrified they're going to release something. There's going to be a huge incident and I'm going to look like a moron because I never looked at it first. And so I know I'm not, we're supposed to not have gates anymore, but she's like, I don't know how to get my work done. And so we talked about different ways she could do things. But I have seen this multiple times where basically instead of, so they've created a policy that we're not going to do gating anymore. And by gating, I mean, you have to come to the security team and talk to them. And it's a totally manual process. And you have like a bunch of meetings or fill out forms, et cetera. Like it's a gate and you have to hoop, jump through the hoops in order to get to prod. And it always slows things down by a lot. And so they're like, we're not going to do that anymore. But then what the person does is they abuse the CICD to make it break every time. So you have to go see them. So they slow you down on purpose, not because it's adding business value, not because they've caught a legitimate serious security thing, but because they can't keep up. And so everyone in the entire IT department has to stop for them. And I'm like, that's not okay. Um, <laughs> and I like, I, I get not being able to keep up, I get that. But the answer is not to go against the policy secretly and play like little mind games with everyone. That's not the answer. And that is definitely not a way to build trust because once the developers figure out you're doing that, they're never gonna trust you again. 
And so instead, what we want to do is talk to them about the things you need, like whether it be tests in the CI, whether it be like, I have these project requirements for you and I need to know that though, I need you to give me some sort of evidence that these things have happened before you go to prod. Whatever it is that you are looking for, you need to talk about it before you're just breaking the CI to stop them. And so this is a harder one to understand, but um, if there's questions at the end, just let me know. Okay, missing test results. So this seems so obvious to me when I started, like, cause I was a dev, right? And then I moved to security. I'm like, why aren't we playing the security bugs in Jira? How am I supposed to see them? And they're like, oh, just remote desktop into the server and then jump to this other server and then log into like this tool with a username that's always seems to be expired. <laughs> and then you can dig through every single person's results to try to find yours. And then also none of it makes sense because it's in security words. <laughs> Guess how many times I did that? Like zero, <laughs> right? And so then the bugs don't get fixed. So then here I am like allocating all the bugs to my devs for the week and none of them are security bugs because there's 400 extra steps to go get them. We want our bugs to be front and center and we want them to get fixed. If we make them jump through a hundred hoops so that they can get to the, like to the goal, so that they can get the information, they're a lot less likely to fix bugs. And so I suggest that unless it's incredibly sensitive, we just put it with the rest of their bugs with the idea that they're actually gonna fix them. If you're gonna put them in the bug tracker and you're not gonna fix them forever, I, I do agree that it becomes sensitive information. It becomes a roadmap to attack us. But the idea of putting it in the bug tracker is that it will be assigned to someone and it will be actually remediated. So if something has a secret, obviously we don't put the actual secret in the bug tracker. We say there is a secret. Right, or maybe that's one where it doesn't make sense to put it in there because we don't want people to know the secrets in the code. But generally it's like, listen, we have some injection here, we need to go look at it. We don't want that bug to sit in the bug tracker for a year, but we definitely need to get that fixed. So we need that in front of the developers. So it needs to be in a place that's easy for them to get to it. Okay, runaway tests. So this is a thing where if you do number two, you thoroughly test your tools first, it's helpful. So I ran into this again with a first generation stack analysis tool where, um, so basically the tool was supposed to take 15 minutes. The vendor kept telling us, oh, it only takes 15 minutes. And since our CI, it took eight to 10 minutes, although that more than doubled the time, the developers were like, that's fine, I can do it. But it always took an hour and a half. And the vendor kept telling us, no, it takes 15 minutes. And eventually, like, I remember being in a meeting with them saying, like, is gaslighting, does that cost extra? Or is that just for free? And then every seventh time it ran, it would do the entire code base. And it would take, like, six or eight hours. My devs are like, is this thing on? And so eventually we just had to yank it out. I was like, I don't care if the vendor keeps telling me it should take a maximum of 15 minutes. I don't care what it should do. I care what it is doing. And all my devs are angry. That's what it's doing. It's making my devs angry and not like me anymore. I need them to like me at, or at least tolerate me, right? Or they're not going to fix my stuff when I go, you know, go to make meetings with them. They're not available, right? Like I need to have a good relationship here and you are damaging our relationship. And so runaway tests are a serious thing. And so another thing is, oh, I had this happen with DAST. Like I would go and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna test the dev server. Yeah, meanwhile, it's like, I'm basically DDoSing the dev server because the DAST is like so huge and bad and it's got like 20 connections and it's just like <laughs> fuzzing everything. So that's another thing. You don't wanna use up all the resources so no one else can use the system. So I learned to run DAST at night. I learned to do all these different things so that I would be better at sharing. <laughs> Um, sharing is really important. Okay, number six, impossible service level agreements. So this is how to lose friends and not influence people. Um, so this might sound really weird, but I run into a lot of, inf of what I call the old guard in AppSec. So people that have been doing AppSec longer than me, so I only switched into security. So I did a year of security when I did counterterrorism 
in the early 2000s. And I was like, ooh, I'm not tough enough to work in security. This is too upsetting. The things I saw, I had to see a therapist. Like, I was just like, this is too heavy for me. I'm too soft and gentle. I can't do this work. I'm not tough enough for InfoSec. Then years later, I joined AppSec. And I was like, oh, I can do this. This is great. Um, and so that was only 10 years ago. So people have done this a lot longer than me. So I never see this with new people. I see this with people that don't this a long time. And it's where there'll be a legacy app and it has like lots of vulnerabilities in it. And they'll set up a scanning tool and they'll put a policy. If there's a high, break the build, don't go to prod. The problem with this is that let's say there's 20 highs and I'm a nice little dev and I fix two. Right, so now there's only 18. It goes through the CI and it's like, break, you have 18 highs, fail. Yeah, but there's already 20 in prod. <laughs> so if we release this, we're less insecure, right? So to me, it's obvious we should release it. However, they're like, I don't let highs go to prod. No, you already have, there's thousands. I've, I've seen the bug tracker, there's thousands. No, I don't let highs go to prod. So no, you're not going until you fix all 20. Well, then that's going to be a year. Um, I So what I suggest to fix this is what I call a double SLA, a double service level agreement. So for legacy bugs, bugs that the first time you scan with a new tool, all of those are legacy pre-existing bugs. And I chip away at that slowly. But then for new bugs, I have a different service level agreement. So you may not release anything medium or above that's new, but for old ones, you can't release, let's say criticals. Like we're gonna fix criticals for several months. And then once all the criticals are fixed, it's like, okay, so you're still not allowed new mediums, highs or criticals, but now we're gonna dig away at the highs for the next six months. And this way you can chip away at legacy security debts but you're still, you're not releasing new serious bugs. So I, I've seen it where we'll let new highs out the door because we've set our, our thing to break only on mediums or I mean only on criticals because we have all these old criticals. But meanwhile, we're releasing brand new high vulnerabilities. No, thank you. Um, and so some tools will let you set two different policies and I find that to be a very valuable thing. Another thing you could do uh, like if you're doing stack analysis is you could put some rules in blocking mode like for injection or cross-site scripting because you've eliminated those bugs and you know there should be none left and then for other things you're on alerting and you're like cleaning up one category of bug at a time that's another thing that could really work um, but it's quite important that we have realistic service level agreements um, and so that we don't take everyone off Um, untrained staff. So this is a thing I ran into in the Canadian government and I thought it would just be the government and then I thought I would get out into private industry and everyone would be totally trained. Eh, no. So like I got to go from the government to Microsoft and like they've really got their crap together there. Um, but then I started working at lots of places and it turns out that no, untrained staff is actually really common. Like the company's like, we're gonna do an IT transformation and we're gonna go from like doing stuff on-prem to the cloud and we're gonna go from old legacy monoliths to microservices and we're gonna give everyone no training. And then we just hope it's gonna go super great and people make mistakes and it is not cause they're dumb. If you give, like, if you ask me to go do a bunch of chemistry, would I do a good job? No, because I have zero chemistry training. It's not cause I'm not smart. Right. And so we're like asking them to do essentially brand new types of work. And then they stumble and then we're like, what a bunch of dummies. No. <laughs> um, and so I've seen this where like we've given them no training, especially if they've had no training a really long time. I have this funny story about how I invented DevOps. I did it. Um, so one of my friends called me from the government and it was 2018. And I did this talk on DevSecOps at RSA. And she's like, I just got back to my office and one of my colleagues thinks you're a god. He thinks you invented DevOps because he hasn't had training in like a decade and he'd never heard of it before. And he's like, this Tommy chick's so smart. And he was their senior tech and he'd never heard of DevOps in 2018. 
because they couldn't afford any training and they didn't give him any time so he could self-train. And that's what you end up with. Someone in a really senior position that is an unwilling dinosaur. Like it's not that he wanted to not know. Um, and so, although her and I laughed, I was like, someone thinks I'm just as cool as my mom thinks I am. <laughs> but, but yeah, so we, we need to make sure that like we support our staff. <laughs> and it sounds really obvious when I say it, but you would not believe how many places give like zero training and then they yell at their team for not succeeding. Okay, forgotten bugs. Don't worry, Tanya, it's in the backlog. That's why I'm afraid. Um, so I think it's important that us security nerds look through the backlog and see what's in there. Like if you could do it all the time, that would be great. But if you would just look at least every 90 days and just be like, what is high and critical that's still up in there? Because sometimes, so like, let's say you have a security sprint during a project and they're just fixing bugs the whole time, A plus, awesome. But after the sprint, were there a couple of things that just didn't make it in, but that are really important to you still? Or um, maybe they did do all the things in the sprint, but some of the things didn't make it into the sprint that were important. And so what are you gonna do to manage those risks? So sometimes things go into the backlog and we just assume that the dev leader is gonna look at them but just because it's important to me doesn't mean it's important to them or that they understand why it might be important. And so I think it's really important we look through the backlog and like comb through it and see what's in there because as a person that's done quite a bit of incident response, a lot of the time, the bug that causes the big incident, it's been in the backlog six months or a year, two years, three years. We knew about that injection vulnerability and we just forgot. We don't want that to happen, right? So just comb through it every once in a while and make sure there's nothing terrifying in there. Um, yeah, and then high fives. <laughs> um, no positive reinforcement, negative Nellies everywhere. So security teams are known for showing up with bad news. And I know sometimes we have to deliver bad news because that's our job, but it would be awesome if we gave good news sometimes, right? So like, what if, we showed up and we're like, hey, I, I want to congratulate your team. Like the pen tester came and they could only find mediums. You guys really made that pen tester work hard. Or, you know, I want to congratulate this team on for the first time getting past all of the security tests, like go team, or for fixing all these bugs or whatever the thing is. Like if we could get positive reinforcement just once just once in a while, it would mean so much to the developers. Like my experience when I was a developer was basically the security team making me feel like a moron all the time and them saying no all the time. And lots of us talk about not being the department of no and we wanna say yes more often and that is a huge good step. But we also wanna be the department that says, good job. <laughs> like oh, I did a threat model and I only found one thing. Like, that's incredible. Usually I find like 20. Nice work. We're like, oh, this design looks really good. Thank you. Like, if we could congratulate them and give them some sort of, if we could do recognitions, so like telling their boss they did a good job, telling them they did a good job, telling the whole IT department someone did a good job, giving them a shout out. All of that is really, really helpful for building trust and just like, encouraging them to do more okay number 10 only worrying about your part i'm so so guilty <laughs> um so the, if the security team only worries about their part uh and they don't think about how their parts affect everyone else that's not in line with devops right the first way of devops according to the devops handbook the phoenix project many other things is we want to emphasize the speed and efficiency of the entire system, the whole process, not just our part. That applies to us security folks too. And so um, I have an example of where I screwed this up super bad. Uh, so I deployed a software composition analysis tool and, and a second gen SAST and the product was good. My rollout was bad. And so I set it up so everyone was in the same organization 
And I had this beautiful, like I'll call it like the parent dashboard where I got to see every project, how they were doing. It was great. Every time someone would check in code, it would send them an email and tell them if they had made a boo-boo. So like if they'd made a new bug, uh, and then it would also tell them how they're doing on their legacy stuff. I'm like, this is awesome. And then one of the devs wrote me and said, why are you humiliating me? And he's like, what do you mean? And they're like, I checked in my code and you emailed everyone in the whole company to say I made a bug. Oh no, I did. <laughs> and I had said it. So everyone got an email every time anyone checked code in. So first of all, I'm spamming the crap out of the entire IT department. <laughs> they're getting like 20 emails a day. And then on top of that, I made the dev feel embarrassed. I'm like, oh, I'm so horrified. I'm so sorry. So I yanked out the entire tool and then I redeployed it. So I had a parental dashboard where I saw everything, but there were no alerts except to me. And then I made everyone their own organization. So that dev's team would see their alerts, but not everyone else's alerts. And then I went and I asked for feedback and then they said it was good, but oh my gosh and and like what a time waster for everyone to receive all these emails and then they're trying to search for their bug and they have like 200 devs worth of bugs right like it was just such a disaster and so we need to worry about how our work affects everyone else and ask for feedback and so i had asked for feedback and that's how i found that out but imagine if i hadn't or if the dev hadn't felt comfortable telling me because I've seen it where they're too afraid because they've told the security team and they've been told to go away a bunch of times. So asking for feedback is super important. Multiple bug trackers. So I have seen this less often. However, um, so this is one where I think I've seen it three times instead of 10 like the rest of them, but I found it really, really, really important because it was a disaster. So the QA team had a bug tracker, the dev team had a bug tracker, and then the security team had a bug tracker. Yeah, guess how many security bugs got fixed? Yeah, not very many. Um, we can't expect the developers to log into many, many, many systems. And like the QA team's like, oh yeah, we duplicate our bugs to the dev thing. Yeah, half of them got missed, right? It's really important if we're gonna track something that we give them one place to look. If we're giving them three places or five places, like one of the places i worked with they're like oh they log in here for their sa sca results they log in there for their sas results uh, we email them their dast results but then they have to go and log into this other system in order to actually get it and then there's this other thing that's a secret thing that's on a shared file server I'm just like, no, no they're not doing that they're not going on a scavenger hunt through all of your it department to try to find a bug serve it to them please <laughs> um and so it seems really obvious when i'm saying it but it didn't seem obvious it's like why aren't they fixing any bugs well let me tell you <laughs> okay insecure system development life cycle so this is so i've seen this a lot way more than 10 maybe 30 40 50 times like almost all the time we're doing DevSecOps. we spent two hundred thousand dollars on tools we have five tools in the ci cd we never ever speak to our developers. We never give them security requirements. We never do threat models. We never do security architecture reviews. We don't give them any documentation. We don't give them secure coding training. We just throw tool results at them and we don't talk to them or teach them to do better. The whole rest of our system development lifecycle is complete trash, but we spent $200,000 on tools. We're secure now, right? It is way cheaper to give the developers a list of security requirements for that API they're making. Like, here's the gateway we're using. Here's how to use the service mesh. We want to make sure you do this and this and this. And then they'll actually do it most of the time, right? And then when you test it, it's looking pretty good. But if we just like throw tool results at them and we're like, yeah, your input validation's crappy or this or that, they don't even know they need a gateway because you didn't tell them. And so, the whole SDLC needs to have security steps in it. We need to support them and we definitely need to talk to them. And so I, for whatever reason, people are like, we're doing DevSecOps. Great, I never have to talk to the devs again. Um, so it's, it's really important 
that the, the whole SDLC, so even if you're doing DevOps, we still have requirements, we still do design. Even if you're just designing one feature at a time, I still want them to apply those secure design concepts or threat model major changes, right? And I know we don't all have time to do a threat model on every app, not every like, company has that, but we gotta do something for them. And it can't just be like, we spent all of our money on tools, we've automated away the problem. They still need support. They really, really, really need to be able to ask your advice. 13, so this is the one where I've only seen it twice, but it was such a complete disaster. Overly permissive CICD. So some employees will disable tests in order to get to prod and we need to lock this down. So this is where, you know, the entire company, well, actually now that I think of it, I, might, I think I've seen it way more than two times. So I've seen it two times where it was extraordinarily expensive. So one of the times they let everyone everyone do infrastructure as code and everyone do the CI, CD and change anything they want. So the co-op student was like, very cool. And then instead of releasing 10 containers, they released a thousand and the cloud bill was $30,000 higher than usual. Yeah, co-op students shouldn't be allowed to put whatever they want in prod. I have hired many a co-op student and they're, they're wonderful. I was a co-op student. I wouldn't let me release anything I want into Kubernetes either. Um, I did all sorts of, I actually, when I was a co-op student, now that I think of it, I actually set our lab on fire. Now hear me out. Um, it was a little fire. And like basically we we're making an SSL accelerator and I'd written some scripts to attack the SSL it like the way it was doing it and I had like sort of I was like 21 and I like DDoSed our SSL appliance and it just kept getting hotter and hotter and then I looked and it was smoking and I was like oh no and I stopped and we had to redesign and add fans so yay QA um and like I put out the fire anyway my boss was like good job but don't do that again and so we don't co-op students can really do a lot so let's walk this down and make sure only people who know, oh, okay, and the other time, I remember. Okay, so the other time, I'm like playing with the CIs. I'm a consultant, I'm looking around, I'm like, oh, this one guy, you know, I see his name everywhere. So just on a hunch, I did a search. He had 2,700 CIs, one employee. And turned out it was his super fun, good time. And he was spending thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars per month on Azure DevOps time for fun without, yeah. So I like pointed that out to the person I was consulting with. I was like, that seems highly unusual. Yeah, the next week I was like, oh, where's that guy? They're like, yeah, he's fired. Um, so it turned out like, I don't even know how many thousands and thousands of dollars he had spent. He just had like a zillion tests running on nothing for his own fun. Like maybe having five CIs, but 2,700. Yeah. So anyway, you should lock that down. <laughs> okay, 14, automation only in the CI CD. So we should automate every chance we get. So this almost only happens when um, the, the AppSec person, uh, I call it allergic to code. So they used to be an auditor. Uh, they used to um, do like compliance. They've never written code in their life. And it, it's not that they're not a super smart person. It's just that their previous five jobs was writing policy. They've never written code before. So they don't understand, oh, I could just make a cron job to have this run overnight. They don't understand you can automate literally anything. Like I, the first time that this happened, it was someone who so he'd been a green beret. Um, and he had taken a one week Microsoft course and then they'd hired him as a junior AppSec person with zero software experience, unless you count checking your email. Uh, and so he was like, oh, well, this thing doesn't come with this feature. So I guess we're screwed. I'm like, no, I'll just automate it to run. I'll just like do a little Python script or something. Like, we'll figure it out. It's not that hard. And he's like, you can do that. And then I realized that there's all this group of AppSec people that is not insignificant like a very significant percentage of AppSec folks that were late to a meeting and now they're in charge of AppSec, like musical chairs, and they lost uh, because they just don't have a person on staff with the experience to do it and someone on the security team gets nominated. And they don't understand. 
oh, we could just run that overnight. It doesn't have to be in the CI. Oh, the moment they check their code in, we could run that as a scan. Oh, we could do a pre-commit hook. Oh, we could put it in the IDE so that they can do checks there. And then we also check in the CI. And they're like, you can do that? I'm like, yeah. So share with them. So first of all, like if you are this person, you're still awesome. Ask your devs for help. They love automating. Like I know I did. I was like, yeah, this is great. So ask your devs, can we do this? Because chances that they can do anything. They're amazing. Um, and lots of them really, like they enjoy this work. That's why they're a professional software developer. So if you're like, oh, I wish I could run this here, just ask them if they can help you. And chances are they will. So we can automate all the time. It doesn't have to be in the CI. And then the last one, hiding mistakes and errors. This is industry-wide. How can we learn as an industry if we don't share? So guilty, so guilty. Um, when I started in security, I remember we had this one team that wouldn't let me test anything. They kept telling me to go away. I was wasting their time. The manager didn't want me to invite their devs to any of my lunch and learns because they had important work to do. And so my boss held a special session with them and told them about a bunch of security incidents we had including one that was with one of their apps that they had not allowed me to test. And that incident cost more than the house I lived in. It was extraordinarily damaging. And so he shared all of our mistakes. Um, and he was like, yeah, there's this security incident where you know, one of the employees had their personal data spilled and she's a grandma. And Tanya was like helping her change her banking passwords. And she was like crying in Tanya's arms. Grandmas cry when we fail. And they're just like, oh, and he's like, and then the last incident, and he told them about like this app, and he's like, that was your app. And they changed from, literally, I would go over to their area and their manager would tell me to F off, like literally use the F word in the office and be like, get the F out of here. And I was like, I'm nice, why are you so mean? Um, and so he changed from that to, we are going to fight the good fight with you. This is never happening again on our watch. Like they went like this to being like, they were, became like the best team of all the teams. Um, and it was because we had like basically pulled back the covers and showed them how it was not going very well. As an industry, I know a lot of us have signed a non-disclosure agreement. I joke that I am made out of NDAs because I have signed so many. <laughs> um, doing consulting, doing speaking engagements, doing like contracts, like just so, so, so many. Um, but if we share overarching lessons with each other, all of our industry moves forward. And so I'm not asking any of you to break an NDA or do anything that would endanger your livelihood. But if it's possible to share, so an example of sharing could be, you know, many places I've worked, X has happened. Or um, so like, so I work at SemGrep and so forgive me talking about work, but like our product, you can write rules. So it's like, what if you wrote a rule and then you actually shared it in like, I don't know, a GitHub repo somewhere so that other companies could go and grab it and use it, right? And I know other stack analysis tools, you can write rules for them too. Right. So if you write a really good rule and it's really helping your org, what if you shared it with other orgs after you fix the bugs? Right. So obviously you want to fix all the instances of that bug and then you share it because you're saying I used to have this problem. Right. Um, but like there's so many different ways that we could share lessons learned. And so if you're watching this, like the recording or live, please consider sharing if you can. So don't break NDAs, don't get fired, don't harm your clients, but if we can share, try to. So I was really afraid. I was like, we're going to look dumb. The devs are going to, you know, not like me even more from that team. And it was the exact opposite. Being honest and being vulnerable in front of them completely changed the way they did business with us. So, okay, rant over. <laughs> so conclusion. So what did we learn today? So ideally we learned some people learn best from what went wrong and the why of what went wrong so that we can do better. We looked at DevSecOps from sort of the other side so that we can improve. 
Um, and we talked about several strategies so that we could roll out better because a lot of DevSecOps, a lot of the problems are with rollout, like more than half. Rollout is the hardest part. And so I'm hoping that you'll have better rollouts. And with that, I have some resources for you. So the first bunch of resources, so this is a link so that you could just go get my slides right now. And I can put that in the chat once I'm not sharing my slides, but it's like kind of hard to do right now. And it is case sensitive. So um, I'm like, which is such a pain. So I'm sorry, but maybe take a screenshot and it'll be on the last slide. Um, resources SEMGREP. So we have a newsletter and I make sure it is not just marketing materials. There's community events, there's all sorts of stuff. We have an open source Slack, all sorts of things like that. Um, SEMGREP Academy. So this is my current work project. So technically it's not supposed to be public yet, but you are all invited. And basically we're taking all the WeHack Purple courses and putting them in there for free. Everything's going to be free. We're making courses about our products. We're making courses about functional programming. We're making courses about how to build your own secure guard roles. So you can try to get your developers back on track. And so the idea of this is we want to share knowledge and move our industry forward. And so as long as there's a price to learning, it's gonna be hard for us to win, right? So this is my personal and professional effort to try to move us forward. So there's gonna be secure coding is gonna come out in like three weeks from now. We're just gonna have like lots and lots of stuff in there. Uh, resources me. So um, if you look up She Hacks Purple, that's pretty much always me. Um, I have a YouTube channel. I just released an incredibly silly music video that's like a parody um, where I sing about computers because I'm a nerd. Uh, and I, yeah, it is very silly. Um, I have a blog, I have a newsletter, and all those things are free. I just, I share lots of stuff. So if you're like, I liked this, there's tons more for you. Um, and with that, I want to say thank you. Thank you, OWASP Cincinnati, for having me. Are there any questions? Thank you so much. If anybody has a question, put your you can raise your hand or um, put a message in the chat and I can unmute you. Yeah. Oh, Jeff, I think there oh, may yes. have been. I, sorry, someone commented security champions are great also. Yes, I agree so much with you. I think there were some questions earlier. Um, somebody asked about so speaking of testing, is there an equivalent of unit testing or end-to-end -end testing for pipelines? I'm a developer by trade, but I'm having to wear multiple hats now that I'm starting a company. Interesting question. So I, I have seen a little bit of, um, so I used to do, I used to try to preach that people should do more negative unit testing. So most unit tests are positive tests. So it's like, does it do what it should do? Um, but you can make abuse cases or negative unit tests. Does it not do what it should not do? But it takes a lot of engineering hours. Um, and then I started working at a SaaS company and I figured out, so instead of writing, so generally almost always what people would do was would do cross-site scripting unit tests, right? And they would go to the cross-site scripting evasion cheat sheet from OWASP, which is awesome, by the way the filter evasion cheat sheet A plus. And then I would take those 12 or 14 things and turn them into unit tests. And then they'd have to copy them and change them and move them. And it would take like days. Then I figured out instead, if you have a static analysis tool and any of the ones where you can write rules, and I'd say at least half of them on the market, you can write your own rules. So write a rule for that. And you just have to write one rule per language. Um, and then you can force it against your entire code repository. You could force it upon check-in. And so that scales better than a unit test. However, if you don't have a SAS tool, and there are free SAS tools uh, like ours uh, that you can write unit tests or that you can write these custom rules with. But so if for some reason you don't want to use a stack analysis tool, that's okay. You can do it with unit tests, but it takes exponentially longer. The unit test should be run before you check in your code. So ideally, a developer, they have however many unit tests, they check it into source safe with all their code. And then before they check in whatever, they run all the unit tests, they make sure everything passes. Then they're like, OK, now I'm ready for the next step. Um, if they're not running the unit test, then the unit tests don't offer a lot of value. But they're supposed to run them, then check it in. Does that answer your question? Is that helpful? 
I'm going to see if there's any more questions. Yeah, some people are commenting they're having a hard time with the link. Oh, OK, um, just a second. Uh, so let me see. I'm going to I'm going to stop sharing so that I can escape. Um, escape and then. Second. And then uh, also I see Jay, you have a hand up. Ah. Yeah. I was just kind of curious when you were talking about, you know, trying to get those security findings from these tools into the hands of developers by pushing it to whatever, you know, ticketing system they have. Um, you know, we we haven't had a lot of success with that, but we've, we've made it very easy to get in the platform. And I feel like one of my concerns with pushing it in there is that it, it's, it's sometimes hard to get all the extra information in that platform tool to, to actually put that into the tickets so that developers have like resources on training and things like that. So, you know, what is, do you think that's still good as long as we're making it accessible or it should the effort really be to also put it into that ticketing system? Am I allowed to ask which ticketing system you're using? Now, there's a lot. Um, so some of the things have oh. Jira. Um, some of them use uh, something called Pivotal. Um, but yeah, okay. they, they different teams have different ones so so most companies uh, or so most tools work with jira because it is by far hands down the most popular one um service now is super wildly popular as well so those two pretty much all products have to work with them or else like you sort of don't exist so ideally there should be a good integration and if there isn't a good integration for either of those two specifically you should write your vendor and be like so do you like us or not because uh i i know from being on the vendor side if you don't work with jira it's like um so you can pressure them to be like oh these fields are going over like we want this as a feature request and most companies especially if they're a startup they're like yes sir because uh, they're just so happy you're a customer so uh, not that I want you to turn the screws, on, but turn the screws on them. Um, as a person that built software forever, like I, I've been on the other side of that. So like, yeah, we better do that. Um, for the ones that are like the systems, the bug trackers that are less popular, you can write a script to bring it over. Or it's like, well, you're not using the super popular bug tracker, so you only get this information. Pros and cons of that. So ideally, remediation advice is is really good to help them you might want to um so the thing that i used to do is i would just attach whatever oasp cheat sheet applied to the thing so if it was cross-site scripting i'd be like here's the oasp cross-site scripting prevention cheat sheet super valuable um injection there's an injection cheat sheet or input validation cheat sheet etc and so for as many as i could i would include those and that's usually really good advice as a person that teaches secure coding on the regular, I have to say that the advice in a lot of these tools is like <laughs> imperfect. That is such a good way to say it. Like I was using a tool the other day and it was like, yeah, blah, 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 you have injection. So you should sanitize this. I'm like, no, you should use parameterized queries and then you should validate the input. And if the input isn't exactly what you're expecting, you should say no. Don't take out the crappy stuff and put in good stuff because it's so easy to mess that up. That's a last resort. Um, and so then I was like, I want to write to you about your tool because <laughs> I'm that nerd. Um, and they're like, okay, write it out for us. And I'm like, yeah. Uh, so I would say that like, if you can provide, especially if, um, so I hope this doesn't sound like way too much work, but if every time there's injection, you're like, this is the thing to do, like just for the top, 10 um and i don't mean oas top 10 i mean your top 10 or your top five and mm -hmm. then ask them to come to you if they're not sure but it's the remediation advice that so which line of code what the problem is and remediation advice those are the really important things everything else it's like in my opinion less important sorry for the long rant no no it sounds fine so just to make sure i'm hearing that your suggestion though still is kind of get it as close to their normal workflow as possible so that they're not having to make these extra steps. And I think that makes a lot of sense. So, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. My pleasure. We have something like that and it seems to work for us pretty well. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Were there any, it says, do you recommend any static security analysis tools, particularly open source ones? So yeah, SamGrep has a free one. 
Um, obviously, I suggest the paid one first, but if you have no budget, the free one is good. Uh, there's like differences between the two, but basically you can download it and run as many times as you want for free. And you can write your own custom rules for it. And so um, I would say of all the free SAS, uh, like it does the most languages quite well. Um, if you're just using Ruby, break command's really nice. It only works with Ruby, but gosh darn does it work with Ruby. <laughs> um, so thank you for the questions. These are so good. Um, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Oh, somebody just posted another possible. Oh, oh yeah. So um, okay, so that link is a series of blog posts I wrote about this. So, oh yeah, so the link is broken, I'm sorry, I, I forgot. So I switched newsletter platforms and I completely forgot that's where I kept those slides. So I just have to move the slides to my web space for my website. Um, SEMGraph, no, no, it's um, SEMGraph, sorry. SEMGraph OSS, actually, if you look at that. Um, and if you want to learn how to use it, go to SEMGraph Academy. <laughs> Um, we're releasing a course, I think. So I'm on vacation as of tonight at five for a week. By April 14th, basically, we're supposed to be releasing a whole bunch of courses, but a few of them are already live. Well, thank you so much, Tanya. I uh, really appreciate you coming on. Um, I apologize again to everyone for the some of the trolling. Um, we'll make sure that's not not published. Um, I really enjoyed those stories. Those are some some really great stories. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, remember to keep up with us on Slack and on Meetup in the OWASP Slack channel. Uh, before we go, I wanted to mention, and I mentioned this in the Slack channel on the OWASP workspace, there's a Cincinnati, uh, Chapter Cincinnati channel. Um, I mentioned there we were talking about potentially moving back to in-person events. Um, for the sake of, you know, networking and stuff like that, it's it's uh, something we would really like. Oh, okay. I'm saying she has to go. Okay. Um, something that we really, really like to, to move back towards. Um, if you have input on that, please reach out to us on the Slack channel or to JRI directly. Um, if you have ideas of locations or stuff like that, we're working on that. Hopefully, we'll have an announcement um, on that front soon. So uh, keep your eyes open. And um, that's it. So thank you all for coming. Have a oh, Slack link. Yes, I will post a link to the uh, invite, you can go to the, the Slack invite page from OWASP and um, put in your email, you'll get, a, you'll get an invite. Uh, and then we're the chapter Cincinnati, chapter hyphen Cincinnati um, uh, is the, the name of the channel. So um, join us there, please. And uh, of course, meet up also um, wherever you, however you signed up to this via meetup. So uh, follow us there too. So thank you everyone so much for coming and uh, have a great weekend.